All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today we'll be talking about Nichiren and Nichiren Buddhism. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics to get into uh, when it comes to you know, the history of Japanese Buddhism, Buddhism and, and, and the world today. First, introduce myself. Howdy. My name is Aaron Prophet. I'm an um, Associate Professor of Japanese Studies at the University at Albany. Uh, here is my email address um, if you would like to uh, follow up with any other uh, with any questions or or thoughts on the discussion today. Um, yeah. So uh, today we're talking about Nichiren. Um, Nichiren, uh, like Honen and Shenron and Dogen, uh, is what we sometimes call a you know one of the the great founders of the Kamakura period, right? So during you know early medieval Japan, a lot of chaos, a lot of Change, rapid social change and new religious groups evolve in relation to those. Um, uh, Nichiren is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting figures in Japanese Buddhist history, also one of the most uh, controversial and complicated. Um, I sometimes have difficulty getting my um, college students exci as excited about Nichiren as I am because an aspect of his thought that feels kind of uh, fire and brimstone-y, and uh, some, some students are not, not too interested in that, but I um, want to do a little show and tell real quick. I want to show this book right here, uh, Original Enlightenment and the Transformation of Medieval Japanese Buddhism by Jacqueline Stone. Um, Jacqueline Stone, who recently retired from Princeton, is, in my opinion, or you know, has been the, uh, uh, the, the top scholar of medieval Japanese Buddhism. Um, my advisor, Mike Auerbach at Michigan, was her student, so I've been very lucky to learn from her and uh, um, uh, her other students uh, as well. She's a great scholar of medieval Japanese Buddhism, but also Nichiren Buddhism in particular, as well as the various other traditions around that, especially Tendai. Um, she's also done some work on esoteric pure land and other things like that. Um, she, from what I understand, is currently working on a book about Nichiren, which will prove to be the book on Nichiren uh, once that uh, is done. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I have another little bit of show and tell. This is a, uh, a, a service book for Nichiren Buddhism that I received uh, in 2005 when I lived in Japan. Um, I lived in a small town called Tamana uh, in Kyushu uh, when I was working as an English teacher way back then. And behind my school was this beautiful temple. And uh, I got to know the priest there and um, their family and you know, would occasionally stop by for tea and a chat and learn a bit about Nichiren Buddhism. Um, in general, everyone else I knew in town was Jodo Shinshu. That's how I learned about Shin, Shin Buddhism as well. Um, but I did know this, this one Nichiren priest and I knew um, a, a Nichiren family as well. A, a friend of mine, uh, their family was Nichiren. And uh, the first time that I ever got to celebrate Obon in Japan, uh, you know, what some people refer to as the Japanese Buddhist Day of the Dead, uh, was with this Nichiren family. Um, and um, maybe I'll talk about that, uh, th those interactions a little bit more um, it, uh, later on. So let's go ahead and jump in uh, to our discussion of Nichiren. All right. So Nichiren um, is one of the later um, uh, uh, Pure Land. Uh, I'm sorry, but one of the later, um, you know, Kamakura founders. Um, he was um, uh, trained uh, in the Tendai tradition, like Honen and Shinran and, and Asai and Dogen and, and Ipin and others. So you know, connected with Mount Hiei, connected with Tendai Buddhism, and. One of the things I want to mention is that, like today, we tend to think of Buddhism as broken up into discrete schools. You've got Pure Land Buddhism and Zen Buddhism and Nichiren Buddhism and Tendai and Shingon and everything else, right? But in the medieval period, everything kind of overlaps together, right? It's like so people studied a little bit of everything all you know uh, the, throughout their career. Um, you know, I, I, it, to my college students, I sometimes describe it like changing your major as um, you know, you work through school, you know, maybe there's a particular, you know, charismatic professor uh, whose class you really enjoyed, maybe then you switch to, you know, physics or geology or, you know, something like that. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> and, you know, while today we may think of Tendai as being a particular school of Japanese Buddhism, during the early medieval period, Tendai was in very, in many ways, a comprehensive approach to Mahayana Buddhism. Um, some people say eclectic, but 
uh, Tendai priests that I've worked with in the past say maybe not eclectic, maybe more comprehensive, and I think that's a, that's a fair assessment. Uh, so, so Nichiren begins with this comprehensive approach to Buddhism that includes um, uh, both the study uh, and devotion, study of the Lotus Sutra, but also devotion to the Lotus Sutra. That's one of the interesting features of Mahayana Buddhism is, uh, you know, devotion to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and gods and so on, but also to texts, texts as objects of devotion and within Nichiren Buddhism. And, and for many Mahayana Buddhists, in fact, the Lotus Sutra is one of these popular objects of devotion. Um, Nichiren is also well-versed in esoteric Buddhist traditions, and yeah, though he does eventually critique or criticize esoteric Buddhism, um, he nonetheless is uh, you know, uh, heavily influenced by and draws upon some of the things that we, that we saw in, uh, we see in esoteric Buddhism. Um, just re you know, remind uh, uh, viewers or, or listeners that we also did an episode on esoteric Buddhism, so if you want to go back and look, um, you can get a little more uh, in-depth treatment of that. Um, there is a tradition on Mount Koya, which is one of the great Shingon centers in Japan today, that there's a tradition about Nichiren having practiced there. Now, I don't know if that actually happened, but, you know, um, uh, I think that just goes to show that today on Koya, on some Shingon Buddhists are trying to find ways to connect with uh, the, with the legacy of Nichiren. And then um, we also have... Uh, uh, there are also stories about Nichiren having some con some earlier connections with with Pure Land Buddhism, and later on in his career, Nichiren is highly critical of Pure Land, uh, seeing it as a deviation, uh, kind of you know you know seeing some of the uh, what he sees as extreme components of the Pure Land tradition as being a rejection of the things that he finds to be most valuable within Buddhism, which you know uh, very much the uh, Lotus Sutra, and according to one story I heard. Nichiren began, uh, you know, practicing with someone who was focused on Pure Land, but then when this master died a painful death, he decided maybe Pure Land was not the right path. Because for many Buddhists during this period, having a peaceful death through your Pure Land devotion is the goal, right? So, uh, you know, again, this is one piece of the broader tapestry of medieval Japanese Buddhism uh, that Nichiren found somewhat lacking. Now, uh, but one of the key practices within uh, Nichiren Buddhism uh, that, that you know, Nichiren promoted was the recitation of the title of the Lotus Sutra. Uh, the, this is often referred to as the Daimoku. Now, the word Daimoku in Japanese just means title. Um, um, uh, in, in this case, the title we're referring to is the title of the Lotus Sutra itself. Um, so th this phrase begins Namu, and uh, you, know, you, know, you probably know the word Namu, like if you go to yoga class, we would say Namaste. Nama is like kind of uh, like, a, like a greeting, right? And then, you know, this becomes Namu uh, in, in Japanese. Um, Namu can also mean like I take refuge in or I, you know, contemplate or I, I, I revere, um, I pay homage to, something like that. Myoho uh, is uh, the sublime Dharma. Renge is lotus and Kyo is sutra. Uh, so this is like, you know, hail to the Lotus Sutra of the Sublime Dharma, or, or, or something like that, right? Um, so, <clears throat> but uh, the recitation of this phrase, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, often sounds something more like Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And uh, according to, to one uh, hagiography, you know, Nichiren, like many of the other uh, Kamakura founders, is trying to find what is what is essential, what, what is the key uh, to, to, to Mahayana Buddhism. And while reciting uh, the, the title of the Lotus Sutra as the, as the sun rose, um, he, uh, you know, has this vision, you know, and, uh, you know, the, then he takes the name Nichiren, which is sun and lotus, uh, which I think is pretty cool. Um, one of the other uh, aspects of Nichiren's thought that I think is interesting is, is his, um, uh, I don't want to say exclusive devotion to Shakyamuni, but his um, his critique of other forms of Buddhism at his time that seemed to focus on all sorts of Buddhas and all sorts of Bodhisattvas. Um, you know, one of his critiques of Pure Land Buddhism is this uh, almost exclusive devotion to the Buddha Amitabha, or in some cases, actual exclusive devotion to the Buddha Amitabha. So, in response to that, Nichiren really focuses on uh, the, the on the Buddha Shakyamuni. 
And instead of, you know, focusing on the pure land of Amitabha, Sukhavati, uh, it, he seems to regard the, uh, the site where the Buddha taught the Lotus Sutra, Vulture Peak in India, which is a real place that exists, he seemed to regard that as a kind of trans-temporal, trans-historical uh, pure land in itself, so that, um, you know, this kind of, you know, space within which Shakyamuni is eternally preaching the Lotus Sutra. I think that's a really interesting idea, um, which also in some ways connects with um, esoteric uh, concepts of the Pure Land as being uh, here and now or within us and all around us. Um, um, Nietzsche even emphasized the importance of practice uh, and that through practice we can have this uh, intimate connection with the primordial, the fundamental Buddha. Um, he also emphasized the study of the Lotus Sutra, uh, devotion, and so on. Um, Nietzsche famously said that what um, uh, Zen Buddhists are a bunch of devils, esoteric Buddhism is going to ruin the country, and uh, chanting the Nembutsu is a one-way ticket to hell. Now, those types of statements really turn my students off. So. I tried to advocate for a more Nietzschean friendly perspective that sees him as someone who is, uh, you know, really trying to respond to you know, what he saw as a world in chaos, right? We have, um, you know, the rise of the warrior class, which brought a lot of political and social instability. And, and with the idea of karma and the idea of the end of the Dharma age or Mahpo that was pervasive at this time, many people believe that the end times were upon them. So. There's a need to figure out what is, you know, what can fix the world, what can most appropriately respond to these trying times. Uh, for people like Honen and Shenron, um, they, they seem to believe that it was, you know, the kind of taking one piece of the Tendai puzzle, um, the kind of comprehensive Mahayana view, they take one piece to equal the whole. And for them, it was the Pure Land, you know, the Pure Land path. For Nietzsche, it's another piece. It's the Lotus Sutra, and then the, the various philosophical traditions derived from uh, the Tiantai and Tendai traditions as well, uh, kind of focused on the Lotus Sutra. Um, so one of the things that I think makes Nietzsche so interesting is that in response to this world in chaos, he says it's through devotion to the Lotus Sutra that we can that we can fix things. He says a lot of this chaos may come from people allowing these, you know, divergent forms of Buddhism to flourish when we should get back to basics. There's a kind of, uh, you know, fundamentalist vibe there as well. He um, writes this text in 1260, the Risho on Kokuron, which is basically a criticism of the government. But what makes that so interesting to me is that, you know, nowadays people can tweet or, you know, post on Facebook any criticism they want. But during Nietzscheman's time period, that's basically a death sentence. And, you know, if you, if you cr criticize the government, uh, that's risking your life. And for him to write this text, I think, shows a lot of bravery that he, you know, there's a lot of danger to be found in criticizing you know, this warrior government at this time. But he felt so, you know, so strongly uh, about his conviction that he did it anyway. So this made him a controversial figure in his own day. And uh, he was he was banished. They tried to execute him a couple times. Um, there's one story that as the executioner's sword was coming down on him, I uh, was struck by lightning, and but he ended up with this scar on his head. And uh, I don't know. I always thought it'd be kind of cool to have a you know it, you know think about a Buddhist masters as kind of beatific, you know, joyful face, but like this intense, angry-looking Buddhist master with a big scar on their head. I think that's that, that's kind of tough, right? Anyway, um, so um, uh, he supposedly you know had the had this this wound that, that caused him uh, pain uh, later on in life. And um, anyway, um, uh, one time, um, so it's so like I said, I, had, I, I, I knew this family, that I knew this Nichiren family, and they had a friend uh, who also went to their temple who spoke English well, and she was a Japanese teacher. And she offered to, uh, you know, to, to teach me you know, Japanese. And I, you know, I, I needed, I was still studying a lot at that time. So I would go to her house and she had a nice big full traditional butsudan or family altar and I'd gone on a gone on a trip and I was bringing her a present from the trip so when I walked in the first thing you know you put the you put the gift on the altar you ring the bell you know 
And I noticed that her statue of Nichiren has a little, a, like a gauze hat. I said, you know, Sensei, well, why is Nichiren Sama wearing a, a gauze hat? And then she told me the story about the, the, you know, the failed execution attempt where he miraculously survived, but he had this wound that caused him pain. So in some traditions, um, you know, people have a little statue of Nichiren within their family altar. During the cold winter months, uh, that statue will have a, have a little hat because, you know, perhaps Nichiren wore one uh, during his lifetime. I thought that was an interesting way that the history of this founder kind of comes to life within people's, you know, you know, daily and annual devotion. Now, next I want to talk a bit more about Nichiren practice. Now, this image here um, is, is, is often called the Honzo. Um, this is a Say a mandalic depiction of the title of the Lotus Sutra. So, right, so written down the middle, these kind of sweeping brush strokes is Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, the title of the Lotus Sutra. At the four corners, we have the four, uh, the, the four, the four gods of the four corners, like the heavenly protectors of, of the world. There's also the the god Hachiman, who's a a, a god of war. There's um, Amaterasu. There's Saicho, the founder of uh, Japanese Tendai. There's um, Jiri, the founder of Chinese Tiantai, uh, as well as various gods and, and other figures that are uh, said to be protectors of the Lotus Sutra. Now, in some traditions, you might have a statue of Shakyamuni or a statue of Amitabha or a mandala on your altar. But for Nichiren Buddhists, this is the main object of devotion. Uh, this plus sometimes a little statue of Nichiren. And uh, this is referred to as Honzon. Now, the word Honzon just means object of devotion. Uh, you know, in the same way that the word Daimoku just means title, but in this context, in the Nichiren context, Daimoku is the title of the Lotus Sutra, and Honzon is this particular image, this mandalic depiction of the title of the Lotus and all the, the gods that, uh, the, and other important figures that protect uh, the, the Lotus Sutra. Um, Nichiren Buddhism in practice includes not only de, you know, devotion to this to this image uh, and re reverence and devotion to Lotus Sutra, but also the chanting of the title of the Lotus Sutra, chanting of the the, the uh, key chapters of the Lotus Sutra, like chapter two on Upaya or chapter sixteen on the Eternal Shakyamuni. Now, with it, the Lotus Sutra is really interesting and, and complex, and we should do a whole episode just on just on the Lotus Sutra, um, but. <clears throat> There are various ways of dividing the Lotus Sutra, either divided in half or you divide it in three or four parts. Um, but there's this interesting point in the Lotus Sutra between chapters 15 and 16. And in, in chapter, chapter 15, we have the bodhisattvas coming out of the earth. There's all these bodhisattvas you know, pouring out of the earth, these great uh, you know, protectors of the Lotus and, and great teachers uh, who are students of Shakyamuni. But then the question becomes like, Wait a minute, how could Shakyamuni, if you're a human who's been alive for, you know, 60 years or however long, um, how can you have these bodhisattvas as students? Uh, that would be like a that would be like a young man pointing at an old man and saying, this is my son. Uh, that, that's what it says in the text. And then chapter 16, Shakyamuni reveals something very important, that the Shakyamuni that we all know and love is not the whole picture. That in fact, the Shakyamuni that we know is just one part of his broader career. That uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, in fact, is something like a cosmic force that has always been active, bring, bringing beings to enlightenment. And chapter 16 begins, you know, with Shakyamuni saying, you know, I have been, um, you know, teaching beings that, you know, uh, you know, it, since beginningless time, um, you know, my lifespan has no measure. Uh, it's a really interesting kind of cosmic reveal of uh, within the Lotus Sutra. Uh, and in um, one of the uh, newer Nichiren traditions called Risho Kosekai, their primary object of devotion is, is an image of this kind of eternal Shakyamuni, like Shakyamuni as, I don't know, how, how, to, how to put this, like, as enlightenment itself bringing beings to awaken. And I just think, I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, this, this practice the, the, of re the reciting the title of the Lotus Sutra, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, is, uh, you know, is done in community often. And uh, you know, from my experience in seeing uh, you know, Nichiren in practice, you know, community is really key here. It's not 
um, you know, not necessarily monks off in mountains by themselves, rather, you know, families and communities and so on. And, and often this is what this is what Buddhism in practice looks like, right? But I think there's a strong emphasis on communal recitation. And one of the things that I learned while, while living in Japan and you know, being in Buddhist places, doing Buddhist things with Buddhist people, is that there is something very magical about reciting something, you know, in a large group of people, like as your voices all blend together, something very powerful about that. Um, and, you know, um, again, different aspects of Nichiren Buddhism are really distinct, you know, I think, I think meant to distinguish it from the, the other schools of Kamakura Buddhism. So in some of the Pure Land traditions, study and practice are really de-emphasized, but for Nichiren, uh, study and practice are emphasized, right? You're supposed to study the Lotus Sutra, learn these teachings you know, and the teachings of Nichiren and, uh, you know, practice assiduously, especially within community. Um, so these are, you know, some aspects of Nichiren in practice. Uh, but I also wanted to talk about a couple of, a couple of the, the doctrinal aspects of Nichiren that I think are really interesting. First is the, what I translate as the five propagation criteria. This is first, that the Lotus Sutra is the highest teaching of the Buddha. Um, that uh, the Lotus is the most appropriate teaching for beings, um, for, for our capacity, because, because we're living in Mapo, the end of the Dharma age, um, we're far away from the teaching of, of, Sh of Shakyamuni's lifetime, right? And our capacities have therefore declined. Like our ability to succeed in practice has declined. Therefore, um, the lotus is even more important. And, and actually, the whole idea of the end of the Dharma, um, in my view, often set, often works like a setup to a punchline. The setup is we're in dangerous times. The punchline is therefore we've got to fo focus on this particular teaching, whether it's your know, esoteric Buddhism or the Nembutsu or the Lotus Sutra. And, and there are other other Buddhists that seem to have rejected this idea of the, the end of the Dharma, saying that, that don't worry about it, it doesn't actually matter, right? Because we have this, this particular practice, right? So different different Buddhists are responding to this idea in different ways. But for Nichiren, you know, because this is the end, the end, the Dharma age, uh, the Lotus Sutra is even more important because it is that that text, that teaching, which can most adequately, um, uh, you know, respond to the needs of beings in this difficult time. Right. So, uh, number two is most appropriate for our limited capacities, right? Uh, but, but also, you know, you know, most appropriate for this time, right? Because it's the Dharma age, uh, the end of the Dharma age, the time of Mapo, um, the Lotus Sutra is the most most appropriate, right? And number four, the Lotus is most appropriate for Japan. This is one of the one of the things I think that's interesting about studying medieval Japanese Buddhism is that Buddhists in Japan during this time are painfully aware of how marginal Japan is. The center of the spiritual world is India, the center of the uh, cultural world is China, and then Japan, way off on the far uh, eastern edge of the world. And that uh, marginality is something that medieval Japanese Buddhists are clearly aware of, but that sets up a kind of hierarchy. You know, China and India up here, Japan way down here, and one of the cool things that esoteric Buddhism does, or you know, other forms of Buddhism as well, is kind of take hierarchies and flip them on their head. That which is lowest is found to actually be highest. So Japan becomes this place where the highest teachings of the Buddha are actually the most appropriate. Right? So the lotus is the most appropriate for Japan. There's something holy and powerful about Japan itself, with these special islands. Right? Um, and finally, uh, because the Lotus Sutra is the highest teaching, and uh, that this is something that we get out of uh, the classical Chinese Tiantai, is that you know first the Buddha teaches the Avatamsaka Sutra, and people don't quite understand it. So then he teaches uh, the, the text that we would associate with the Pali Canon, and then he teaches the uh, you know uh, doctrines of emptiness, and then various other Mahayana sutras, and then finally we get to the Lotus Sutra and the Nirvana Sutra as the highest teachings. Now with the Tiantai system. This is kind of a comprehensive view and you just kind of study everything. For Nichiren though, because the Lotus is the highest and you've had the karmic good fortune to encounter it, don't worry about the other stuff. Focus on the most important thing. This is that, that is another view uh, as well. Um, yeah, so uh, and then another interesting teaching I find is the uh, 
the Sait Sandai Hiho, or the, the Three Great Secret Dharmas. This is the, uh, said to be the secret teaching of Juri, the founder of Chinese Tiantai, and Saicho, the founder of Japanese Tendai, for the attainment of Buddhahood in this body. The first one is the Daimoku, the title of the Lotus Sutra, as the union of faith and practice. That the, the, and the way that I've sometimes heard the Daimoku described is, imagine uh, the, there's a universal frequency, and this kind of goes back to esoteric Buddhist theories of mantra and whatnot, but the universe has this frequency, and by dialing into that frequency, things in your life will improve. And according to Nietzsche in Buddhism, the recitation of the title of the Lotus Sutra is that rhythm that you can tap into. I think that's an interesting way of, of explaining it. It's also an interesting way of thinking about mantra or the nembutsu or these other uh, vocal ritual technologies, things that you chant. What is the point of chanting? The point of chanting is to get with the rhythm, get with the flow of, of reality. Yeah. Um, so the Daimoku is this place where you know, faith and practice, where um, the uh, the practitioner and the Buddha to which you are devoted ultimately become one. Right. So you know, in the context of chanting, like the chanting itself is not a tool that achieves a goal, but the chanting itself is that whole reality present and condensed. Uh, then we have the idea of the, the Daimoku as an object of devotion or meditation, um, and that is the the Honzo. Right. Um, the Hon Zone is the that mandalic depiction, right? So you have like this is a is a key object of devotion uh, to, to help kind of facilitate your experience of this enlightened wisdom. And then we have the Daimoku as sanctuary, okay, or, or the, the Kaidan. The, the, this is um, uh, this one's a little complicated. But I like to think of it as the site of practice. So there's a couple different ways to explain this one as well, but you know, think of it as like the site of practice. So you, you know, you're sitting before the Daimoku, you're reciting the, uh, the you know, the title of the Lotus Sutra. This space becomes, um, you know, kind of a, a, you know, kind of does the work of the precepts even. Like, like, like it validates your practice. It, it, it provides a firm foundation for your practice to be performed and be effective. Um, and kind of pulling these all together, you have the union of wisdom, meditation, and precepts, which are, you know, really the foundations, the foundations of Buddhism, right? Um, finally, I want to uh, talk just a moment about um, uh, the diversity of the Nichiren tradition. Um, uh, after Nichiren's career, the many Nichiren subgroups develop. There's a lot of you know, a lot of different. Uh, lineages and sublineages of Nichiren. And then in the modern period, we have the flourishing of many Nichiren based new religions. I remember one statistic I read in a textbook on Japanese Buddhism said that in the modern period, 70% of the new religions that develop are Lotus Sutra based, and many of them Nichiren derived. One of the most popular is Sokogakai, um, as well as its international arm, Sokogakai International. Uh, on the right, we have Tina Turner, and on the left, we have um, uh, Orlando Bloom, um, and, and there are very, uh, very, various other important, um, you know, uh, the, the celebrities in American history that, that happen to belong to Soka Kai and practice Nietzsche and Buddhism. Um, Tina Turner is one of my favorites. It's actually a book, about, uh, I believe a religious biography that is coming out about her soon. Um, she has uh, she has produced albums of her chanting uh, the, uh, the, the title of the Lotus Sutra and often talks about her uh, experience with Nichiren Buddhism and uh, the devotion to the Lotus Sutra as being um, one of the things that helped her overcome her uh, abusive relationship with Ike Turner and you know, to go on to become you know, one of the most important musicians uh, in American history. Um, Soka Gakkai is a, and, and, and we can do a whole episode just on Tina Turner. We can do a whole one just on Soka Gakkai. Really interesting things to to, to talk about. Um, perhaps we can get into a bit more during the, the Q and A session. But uh, yeah, so just want to let's go ahead and conclude here. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, this is a quick overview of some of the basic ideas within Nichiren Buddhism, Nichiren Buddhist practice. And uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, your questions and discussion we'll have. Thank you.